Every year, the Palestinian Authority receives hundreds of millions of dollars from America, also from Israel and the European Union. For the past four years, no one exactly knows how that money is being spent. Palestinian leaders will not release the information. The reason millions of dollars is likely being used to fund terrorism. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem on a watchdog group demanding answers. Over the last few years, the Palestinian Authority has changed its financial reporting, and a leading watchdog group wants to know what it's trying to hide. It used to publish, albeit limited, financial reportings on a monthly basis and an annual basis, but slowly but surely they've been cutting back the amount of publications that they put out. After researching the issue, Maurice Hirsch of the Palestinian Media Watch found the PA hasn't published its annual budget in four years. That means that no one really knows how the Palestinian Authority plans to use their money um, that they have coming in every year, international donor money, Israeli money that's coming in as a result of the Oslo Accords, and even their own money. Almost every country in the world publishes a budget. The Palestinian Authority, which is so dependent on International age doesn't publish its budget. Hearst says even published accounting information of what had been spent is now missing. When you go onto the website of the Palestinian Ministry of, of Finance, there is no access to any financial details whatsoever. CBN News repeatedly attempted to contact the Palestinian Authority, but was unable to get a response. Since its beginning in 1994, the international community has basically funded the Palestinian Authority. More than half of that money comes from Israel, mostly taxes collected from Palestinians working in the country. While the PA collects domestic taxes, the rest of its funding comes from the European Union and the United States. The reason really that they're trying to hide their finances is that Palestinian Media Watch has repeatedly used the reports that they do publish in order to highlight the fact that they pay hundreds of millions of dollars in rewards to terrorists every single year. That's why Congress passed the Taylor Force Act in 2018. Taylor Force was a U.S. military veteran murdered in a terror attack in Israel. His murderer was killed in the attack, and so his family receives a stipend because he was a terrorist. The Taylor Force Act doesn't allow the U.S. to give direct economic aid to the PA unless it stops paying stipends to terrorists and the families of dead terrorists. There's just the aid which is going indirectly via U.S. aid for the benefit of the Palestinians. USAID and the United Nations Relief Works Agency funding goes to infrastructure projects, to schools and health clinics for the people. But that frees up other monies in the PA budget that could be used to pay terrorists. What we've also shown is that the PA has been siphoning off almost a billion shekel, hundreds of millions of dollars every year, at least for the last three years, to what they call the PLO institutions. Her says there's plenty the West can do to hold the Palestinian Authority accountable. He also says transferring money to institutions belonging to the PLO should be prohibited. He says these are elementary requirements that should be implemented quickly. Rewarding terrorism does not promote peace. Siphoning off billions of dollars in order for these PLO institutions to, again, directly or indirectly finance, fund, promote terrorism, does not promote peace. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, this obviously doesn't promote peace. What it does promote is incitement, uh, and we've seen that just in the past few days, where a leader of Hamas in Gaza tells Palestinians to get their guns ready, to sharpen their axes and their knives, and in response, there is an axe attack, a murder of three fathers on the streets of Israel. All because of this, all because of an ideology of hatred. When you look at it, you just shake your head and go, how can you train your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren in this kind of hatred, where you turn them into murderers? And then when they become murderers, you reward them financially and you reward their families. It absolutely makes no sense. That's why our U.S. Congress passed the Taylor Force Act. Now it's up to our current administration to enforce it, to say, no, we're not going to fund terrorism. We're not going to fund the murder of Israelis. Uh, this has to stop.
and I hope they have the backbone to do it. So far, they haven't shown that. They've put back into place things that under the Trump administration, funding for UNRWA, funding for the Palestinian Authority was withdrawn in accordance with the Taylor Force Act. But they've restored that. They've even said we want to put a consulate for the Palestinian Authority right in the heart of Jerusalem. Israel said, no, you're not going to do that in our capital city. So if you want to put a consulate into Ramallah, go ahead, but not, not here on our land. You're not going to do that. So it, it, this, this is one where you, you look at our policies and say, do our policies really intend to bring peace to the region, or do they intend to bring incitement and further terrorism? Uh, that's a question I think the administration needs to be asked repeatedly because we, our tax dollars, are funding this. In other news, gas prices hit an all-time high today. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. From fuel to food, housing, prices are surging across the board. And on Wall Street, stocks took another major tumble to start the week. President Biden's scheduled White House address today focuses on the growing inflation crisis. CBN's Jenna Browder reports. Americans are feeling it in the pocketbook with gas prices at an all-time high and other basics like food spiking. The president knows it's a problem he needs to get out in front of in an election year. According to AAA, the national average for a gallon of regular is now $4.37, up 23 cents from last month and a new record high. Some analysts predict an average price as high as $4.50 a gallon by summer. And it's not just gas. According to the latest Consumer Price Index report, food at home prices have risen 10 percent in the last 12 months, marking the largest 12-month increase since 1981. Prices for meat and eggs increased more than 13 percent over the last year, while beef rose 16 percent. What's more, the USDA predicts grocery store prices will jump another 5 to 6 percent this year. And on Wall Street, stocks deepen their losses on Monday, sending the S&P 500 to its lowest close in more than a year. The president will be speaking to um, his plan, uh, his continued plan to continue the fight uh, to address inflation um, in the coming months. President Biden is expected to address the growing crisis today at the White House. The speech to highlight steps he's taken to help American consumers, like releasing oil from the strategic reserve and contrasting it with Republican proposals. Even some Democrats, including President Bill Clinton's Secretary of Treasury Larry Summers, say the Biden administration's big spending packages increase the surge in inflation. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki taking this pointed question from a reporter. In retrospect, were they right that the, some of the government policies were going to lead to inflation? Uh, I wouldn't say we agreed with them then, and we don't agree with them now. The CBN financial editor, Drew Parkhill. And Steve Ratner, who is also an Obama economic advisor, said this is Biden's inflation and he needs to own it. So their warnings came to pass, and now because of government spending, that's what made high inflation much higher. That spells political trouble for the president and Democrats. A recent ABC News poll shows Americans trust Republicans over Democrats to handle inflation by a nearly 20-point margin. Inflation is the number one political issue because it affects everybody. The White House talks about job growth. Well, that's nice, but that may be somebody down the street. You, on the other hand, are going to the gas pump and you're seeing record gas prices. You're going to the grocery store. You're seeing high food prices. It affects the middle class. It affects people of lower incomes. And President Biden's speech comes just one day before a key inflation report is released. One prominent analyst believes it will show the rate of inflation last month was below the 8.5 percentage rate we saw in March, an indicator inflation may have finally peaked. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. All right, thank you, Jenna. Now to the Philippines, where the son of former dictator Ferdinand Marcos appears to have locked up the presidential election. With 97 percent of the ballots counted, Marcos won more than 30 million votes. The closest contender, the current vice president, has about 15 million. Boxing legend and Christian Senator Manny Pacquiao has the third highest total with three and a half million. 
Protesters marched in Manila denouncing the unofficial results. One leader said they're outraged over a political system that would allow the heir of an exiled dictator to become president. Gordon, for those who aren't familiar, do you think those concerns are warranted? Well, we're, we're looking at a, a complicated election system, and there have been many people within the Philippines that remember the Marco, Marcos years with fondness. Uh, I, I don't understand that, but you, you say, okay, um, if that's there. The, the issue is the just popularity and name recognition, and uh, the Philippine political system is remarkably complicated. Uh, and it, it, it's one that you have to be on the inside to really understand it. So how do the, the quote, ruling families, close, close, close quote, continue to get reelected, uh, continue to have control, is, is one of the great puzzles. Uh, I lived there in a time uh, when uh, Fidel Ramos was president, and it was a, a time of... Uh, real wonderful prosperity for the Philippines and a lot of economic growth. Uh, at the end, there was the whole Asian crisis, and then uh, things sort of reverted back. And, and you, you look at it, and you really scratch your head. But here's the wonderful thing. In the middle of all the political turmoil, in the middle of uh, contested elections, and, and those elections are remarkably contested. In some places, candidates literally are murdered. Uh, you, you, you look at all of that. In all of that, the gospel still goes forward. The Christian church is still wonderfully strong. And I look to our current political turmoil, and I go, well, I lived through that in the Philippines, and let's keep focused on what we need to be focused about, which is let's populate heaven. If you put all of your stock into political victories and, and political solutions to our problems, uh, you will be disappointed. But if you put all of your hope in Jesus, then he will never disappoint you. And the kingdom of God will stand. Not even the gates of hell will prevail against it. So let's look to him. He is the author, the finisher of our faith. Let's do that in the Philippines. Let's do that right here in the United States. TikTok boasts 1 billion users, with tens of millions of them being young people in their 20s. That's why the Democratic Party has launched an app on the social media giant targeting Generation Z. David Brody reports on the DNC's latest strategy to prevent a red wave that the GOP is predicting for midterm elections. Today's hot social media landscape has a lot of top contenders. Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, YouTube. But the one making big waves is TikTok, with more than 1 billion active monthly users. Oh, hello. Here's the Democratic message. We want a free and fair election. A platform where anybody can make short videos and spin current events, politics, and any issue the way they want. Mark Meckler, the former CEO of Parler, lays out the challenge ahead. The difficulty for the American people is to understand what's true and what's not. We have access to more information than, frankly, we've ever had in all of American history. As usual in politics, the battle is on to win the spin game, especially among the early 20s Gen Z crowd. They're known to be politically active, and there's tens of millions of them out there. So far, Democrats have a sizable advantage. Given this is the first midterm cycle in the TikTok era, the DNC recently launched on the app, and they're getting more than 2 million views per week. Caroline Levitt is a Republican running for Congress in New Hampshire. At age 25, she is a member of Gen Z and would be the youngest person elected to Congress if she wins. She understands the battleground. I want your viewers to understand just how significant and frankly dangerous this is, that the DNC is now utilizing TikTok. This is the number one app for my generation of Americans. It's where they go 
to seek their news. My generation is not going to go and fact check these videos. We've lost all critical thinking skills because of social media. So the Democrats are capitalizing on that. They're going to continue to brainwash my generation of voters, which is why it is so important that we push back on this. And while the Republican National Committee still has no TikTok page, the White House is bringing in influential TikTokers to give them talking points on how to discuss things like rising gas prices. 18-year-old Ellie Zeeler has more than 10 million followers. Why is gas so expensive and why is the United States inflation rate at a four-time decade high? I had the opportunity to ask the White House why gas down the street is $7 and here's what they said. Regarding Ukraine, the Biden administration turned to Aaron Parnas since he's a powerful TikTok influencer in this area with live streams that garner millions of views. For the first 15 minutes or so, they briefed us on what the United States is doing to help European allies. And then the remaining 30 minutes, we were able to ask questions like journalists um, about concepts that our viewers or questions that our viewers wanted answers to. One criticism here is that the White House is engaging in state-run propaganda through the younger generation's top social media platform. Democrats, however, see it as a strategy poised to pay political dividends. Is that a genius Democratic move or a Lord help our country movement, uh, a moment, if you will, that the uh, White House is bringing in influential TikTokers? It is wise of them because they understand that these sites are powerful. They recognize that they are winning with my demographic of voters, and they realize that the Republican Party, our side of the aisle, is doing nothing to change that. Another complication is that many Republicans are reluctant to get on TikTok because of its connection to China and private concerns that personal data could be stolen so instead they turn to Instagram and snapchat two other healthy viable alternatives but what about old school campaigning how effective can that still be if you don't go on TikTok, you can do this other ways you have to kind of double up the efforts on other platforms or other ways to get Gen Zers in in other words that's the strategy yeah, absolutely. Get on all of the other sites and then meet these voters where they are in person, right? There's no more effective campaign tool or no more uh, persuasive uh, method you can win a voter over by looking them in the eyes. At this point for the GOP, winning over voters on the issues and in-person campaigning the old-fashioned way may be their best bet because when it comes to TikTok, it's no contest. David Brody, CBN News, Washington. I used to look at TikTok and go, I, I, I can't understand this thing. It just seemed to be a bunch of dance videos. And here, here it is, and it's now morphing into a major news outlet for Gen Z. Uh, I find it incredible, and I find, also find it very hard to keep up with all this stuff. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you, you look at this, is it a, a government propaganda machine? You kind of go, well, wait a minute. Uh, how in a free and open society can we, can we do this? Here's the good news. Uh, if you're a Republican, you get the same access. And so just mimic what the opposition is doing uh, and, and try to outstrip them at it. Uh, take a page from... Uh, the Obama campaign way back in 2008, where they pioneered social media campaigning uh, to how Trump turned Facebook into an um, election engine for him in 2016. Uh, so looking forward to the midterms, looking forward to 2024, uh, realize you have access to, so let your voice be heard. And here's something for Christians. We have access. We don't have to do a political message. Let's talk about the King of Kings and let's have uh, Christ represented on these platforms as well. Lawrence Gibbs lost his six-figure job because of the pandemic. His wife was working part-time. Still, the couple never panicked. Instead, they felt peace and they ended up having their best financial year ever. In May 2020, Lawrence Gibbs walked into his home early from work, still stunned by the news. Just want to share with you that as of today, I don't have a job. The company let me go today. They said because of COVID. I know I felt like a state of shock, but it took less than two seconds. And I was like, we'll be OK. It's going to be OK. Those were her words to me. I remember it. Baby, we'll be all right. Audrey and Lawrence needed faith to believe that since Lawrence earned a six-figure salary in corporate finance. 
More pressure was added to their situation, considering Audrey was retired from her career in banking and finance. She was bringing in an income working part-time for a financial lending firm. After the initial shock of Lawrence's layoff, they both say they felt God's peace. They didn't panic for two reasons. They were longtime savers and committed tithers. The way we tithe or the way we give, we give God 10% first, 15% to ourselves, and then the other 75% goes to bills and other discretionary things. So God honors that too, that we make ourselves a bill or make ourselves important. In Proverbs 3 and 9, the scripture says that the biggest act that you can show to God that you trust him is when you trust him with your finances. Totally. And that's what I had to do, and that's what I did. Lawrence hadn't always trusted God with his money. Early in their 35-year marriage, Audrey learned to tithe off her gross income, while Lawrence gave sporadically at church. So for about three years, Lawrence wrestled with the idea of tithing. I didn't realize that I was holding myself back or holding my family back from other blessings and moving forward. My relationship with God it was not built up enough for me to really understand what I really was supposed to be doing. But I wasn't against my wife doing it. I think that really helped us out a great deal. At that time, Lawrence was promoted to a supervisory position in corporate finance with a 50% increase in his salary. In a new state and new church, they grew in their relationship with Christ. I prayed about it and I told God, I want us to be on the same page as it relates to tithing so we can be blessed financially together. Not that he wasn't blessing us and keeping us, but I knew if we felt the same way about it, it would make a big difference. After Lawrence was given another promotion that moved them back to their home state, he was still wrestling with the idea of tithing. I had been praying about it and my spirit and everything just jumped. It wasn't difficult for me to do then. It was not difficult at all. Once I started tithing along with my wife 10%, we saw an increase in favor, even more at our jobs. Things just got better for us and our kids. We were able to move in very, very nice neighborhoods. Our kids were in some finer and nicer schools. We've never experienced any serious lack since we've been tithing together. We've always progressed with jobs, with homes, with everything. He's always pushed us forward. It went hand in hand, and we were able to save, put money in the bank, and be able to afford to do vacation, little trips, and things of that nature. So after three decades of faithful tithing, they trusted God fully when the 2020 pandemic layoff hit. And both of us together as a team on that day showed that we had trust and faith in God, that we would be okay. The next month, Audrey took on more clients than she ever had. I'm a strict commission. It was like a miraculously in that June of 2020, I made the most money I've ever made in my life in one month. And it just sustained. Instead of Lawrence immediately going out and looking for a new job, they prayed about his new direction. They were reminded of an idea from several years ago about a new kind of serving dish. God clearly said, that's what you all need to do. We had to deal with different engineers and attorneys and patents and trade. We didn't know very much about that type of stuff. We dealt with real estate and lending. It's just unbelievable. I didn't even pray and ask God to, to triple or quadruple my business. It just happened. I totally repaid his salary, his six-figure plus salary. All totaled, Audrey's business increased five times, making 2020 and 21 the Gibbs' best year financially and their invention, Easy Serve, hit the market. We're getting sales as we speak. We're so blessed that God took an idea from a cookout to a product that is needed for the food industry. We're not chasing after money. It's about our relationship with God. We know if we do the things that he has for us, those things will follow. If you don't have a tithing relationship and you start one, God's gonna take care of you. You got to try it, test him. Test him, prove him. It's the only time we get to test God. It's with our tithes and offerings. Here's a promise. It's from Deuteronomy chapter 28. All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. And here Lawrence and Audrey said, yes, we're going to obey God's direction. We're going to give. We're going to give cheerfully. We're going to give generously. We're going to give from our need. We're going to give from our abundance. We're going to give. And they made that resolution, and then God came through. What an amazing thing. And a, a completely different thing. Here they are in a cookout, and they get an idea 
of, of how can we change this? How can we make this easier? And it's wonderful, and it takes off for them. God wants to give you ideas. He wants to give you productivity. He wants to bless you. He's a good father. He wants to look after his children. If you want to start doing that, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. You can join in everything that CBN is doing around the world. You join in this broadcast. You join in all our international broadcasts. You join in Operation Blessing. You join in everything we're doing. That's what happens when you become a 700 Club member. Now, how much is it? It's just $20 a month. That's 65 cents a day. Some of you can give at higher levels. We have 700 Club Gold for you. We also have 1,000 Club. That's $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level, call and join with us. Now, I've got something for you. It's my father's latest teaching, and it's the armor of God. It's the book of Ephesians. When you join at $20 a month, you'll receive one copy. If you join at 700 Club Gold, we've got more for you. You can get three copies. Then at a 1,000 Club member, you get five copies, so you can share it with your family, your friends, uh, so everyone can have the armor of God. I think these days we need to look honestly at what's happening in the world, and we all need that armor on. We all need to be prepared for what's to come. When we look at COVID, when we look at the war in Ukraine, the troubles around the world, inflation right here at home, we need to say, yes, let's put on the armor of God so we're prepared for the days ahead. Let's take care of what he wants us to take care of. Let's obey his word, and then blessings will come. We'll be protected for the years ahead. You know, when you become a 700 Club partner, you help people all over the world. Like this single mom in Thailand, she lost everything when she left her abusive husband. What's worse, his creditors came after her for his debts. Here's how people like you came to her rescue. Yong is a single mother raising her two sons. Ever since she left an abusive husband, she worked from home sewing shirts for a factory. Then her ex-husband's creditors came. To begin paying his debts, she was forced to sell everything, including her sewing machine. I thought, why is this happening to us? Without my sewing machine, I have nothing left. My older son is away at school. How will I send money for food? Buying food for her six-year-old son, Khan, has also been a challenge. When my son is hungry and asks for rice or milk, I can't bear to tell him that I don't have any money. So I borrowed money from a relative to buy milk. At night, I cry while my son sleeps. I feel like I was failing my children. I felt so alone. Eventually, Yang found work as a housekeeper at a university dorm. She and Khan were able to stay there for free, but there still wasn't enough for food. Khan knew things were hard for his mom. When I saw my mom cry, I hugged her. I wiped her tears and I said, I love you. My son gave me comfort and strength. I love sewing, and I told myself that someday I would get another sewing machine. When we met the family, Khan showed signs of malnutrition. So CBN's Orphan's Promise immediately brought food, including a supply of milk. We gave Yang a new professional sewing machine and supplies to restart her sewing business. Word quickly spread at the university, and residents began coming to her for sewing jobs and repairs. And when they learned that Yang knew how to make mosquito nets, they started buying those from her too. I'm so grateful for the food pack and the sewing machines. It feels great to be sewing again. Every day, I earn more than enough to provide for my children. And I've paid off 90% of my debt. I have only $100 left to pay. Yang says now she and her sons no longer go hungry. I am so happy. My children and I have a new life, and it just keeps getting better and better. I thank God for sending you to bring us hope. Thank you for helping me and my mom. 
I want you to know that Yong is just one of many, many people who are in desperate need that you are touching the life of if you're a 700 Club member. What an opportunity to make a difference. This mom so alone, so trapped and trapped unfairly in death that really wasn't hers. And here she is diligently, even after the gifts that you've given her, paying off those debts so that she can have a clean slate. These are hardworking people who want to do everything the right way, who honor God by the way that they live, and who are beyond grateful for your gratitude and compassion. If you're not a 700 Club member, why would you not join today? You can touch so many lives in powerful ways, bringing hope to impossible situations. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member and our, our number's toll free. Right there on your screen, 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say you wanna join the 700 Club. It is a privilege for us to be able to touch these lives. But it's also a responsibility to those who've been given much, much is required. So join with us today. We're out to change the world with the love of Christ, and you can be a part of that. There are many options you have. Some of you might already be General 700 Club members. How about going up to 700 Club Gold with a gift of $40 a month? Or you might want to join our 1,000 Club. That's $84 a month. 2,500 club members come in at $209 a month. We have founders. These are folks who give gifts of $417 a month or more. It's not what you give, it's that you give. Ask God what he'd have you to do and then go to your phone with a sense of anticipation for the difference you're gonna make in someone's life. And I wanna tell you, we're gonna send your thank you Pat's teaching on putting on the armor of God. Get this CD out to you right away. You're gonna love it. Gordon? Well, when you give to the 700 Club, you're part of taking the gospel to children all around the world and right here in the United States. How? Through CBN animation series, Superbook. The Christian duo Jenny and Tyler like to watch Superbook with their four children. They also love to tell other parents all about it. Christian music duo Jenny and Tyler enjoy writing and performing songs about Jesus. When they're at home, they enjoy sharing stories and lessons from the Bible with their four kids. One of their favorite ways to do that is by watching Superbook. They're true to the scriptures, the, uh, the producers, the, it sounds good, it looks good. I love the stories and the, the morality that's brought into it. Knowing that it's something you can trust is a huge deal because there's just so much out there that's like supposed to be about the Bible that's really wishy-washy or just not, not what you really want. And this is so true. Their kids love the adventures and the lessons. I like the characters and how they have problems. And when they go on adventures, they learn from them. I don't ever want to see this guitar again. It's like, oh, I can teach my kid about this scripture, but also about how that applies to modern day. Chris walked out on his audition. Oh, you said you wouldn't tell anyone. I like that um, they have a lesson at the beginning and end. Like it starts with something like that Chris or Joy or Gizmo do wrong. And then like the um, story in the Bible that they're doing like David and Goliath, like teaches um, Chris not to be nervous and stuff like that. I feel like the show has had a really sweet impact on them in that we'll read a scripture and they'll say, oh yeah, like, we, know, we already know about that, Dad, because we saw it in Superbook. I like Daniel and the lion. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so they would not hurt me. He doesn't even have a scratch when he comes out, and, and he's not dead. All those gifts are mine! <laughs> this is what Christmas is all about. I love that, like, the selfishness of Chris and Joy are present in episodes and how they deal with that. Chris wants all the presents for Christmas to himself, but then he goes on a super book adventure and he gives the presents to a little boy. Merry Christmas. I think that he learned to prefer people over himself. Jenny even has a favorite. One thing recently with like the Samuel episode, 
our girls now will say, maybe I need to say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yes. I like to tell my friends about Superbook because it teaches you about Jesus, and it's also fun and entertaining. As they've met other parents, Jenny and Tyler are quick to bring up Superbook. We met some yeah. folks, found out they had three kids, three, uh, three and under, and we were like, have you heard of Superbook? Yeah. <laughs> because it's awesome. We would definitely recommend Superbook because it's been so impactful for our family. Superbook, it's going around the world now in over 50 languages. We want to have it in all the major broadcast languages. Uh, there's a map showing all the different places where it's being broadcast, but the big thing is the Superbook app, how that's spreading around the world. And it's all made possible because people like you care enough to join, to say, I want to be a part of this. I want to preach the gospel around the world. I want to make sure the children of my generation get the stories of the Bible in a language that they can understand. I want to be a part of Operation Blessing. I want to be a part of helping Ukrainian refugees. I want to be a part of all that you're doing. How do you do that? Join the 700 Club. 1-800-700-7000 is the number to call. Now, when you call, ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving, bank doing all the work. There's no checks to write, nothing to mail in. Bank doing everything. So we can send as our gift to you Power for Life monthly teaching CDs. So if you like that, ask for Pledge Express when you call. Or you can go to CBN.com. When you give monthly on the giving page, you automatically sign up for Pledge Express. You can also text us. You can text CBN to 71777, and a monthly giving page will come up on your smartphone. Either way, do it now and be a part of it. 1-800-700-7000. Now, when you call to join the 700 Club, we'll also send you my father's latest teaching from the book of Ephesians. It's called putting on the armor of God. And that's exactly what you'll learn to do as you listen to it. And welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. The Senate has passed a measure to beef up security for Supreme Court justices and their families. The measure makes certain the nine justices are provided security as some protesters have gathered outside their homes. The bill now moves to the House for its consideration. Protests have erupted in front of the Supreme Court building and around the country after a leaked draft opinion suggested a majority of conservatives on the court are prepared to reverse the 1973 Roe decision legalizing abortion. While well, the United States is calling for an emergency meeting of the United Nations Security Council over North Korea's recent missile tests, the regime has fired off 15 missiles so far this year. This past weekend, it tested a ballistic missile mo most likely launched from a submarine. The United States currently holds the rotating presidency for the council. It scheduled the meeting over concerns North Korea's Kim Jong-un threatened to step up his nuclear weapons program. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Rachel Barbo is a rock star in the world of women's sports casting. For years, she reached new heights in her career. But in her personal life, Rachel was battling a raging addiction that would have killed her. For nearly two decades, Rachel Barbeau blazed a trail for women in sports broadcasting. She could be found on the sidelines covering college football or in the studio as the first female host of Sirius XM's radio talk show, College Sports Nation. She was also the first female sports reporter to strap on a helmet and endure a grueling professional football training camp. To those who knew her, Rachel was unstoppable friends, I was outgoing and vivacious, but I had a dark side of my life that very few people knew about, and it was gonna kill me. Rachel grew up the youngest of three with two brothers. Her parents divorced when she was nine. I was a happy kid, I was imaginative. I was spoiled with love. When my parents got divorced, it affected me greatly. My daddy was gone. Now looking back, I can see that as the beginning of a father wound. Then a couple of years later, she discovered that the man she thought was her father had adopted her as a toddler. The best way to describe it is the rug gets pulled out from underneath you. Everything you thought you knew about yourself, everything you thought to be true, the most primal, deepest thing, your parents, that's not true. My own internal dialogue very quickly 
it was, you're illegitimate. And then the natural next step was, you're unwanted. And then I would even say words to myself like, you're a bastard. And no one in my family had ever used those words to me. Uh, but I began to think of myself like that. Then her mother remarried, only adding to Rachel's pain and confusion. I have a biological father. I had an adopted father. I had a stepfather. My parents got divorced. You know, found out I was adopted. Like, that's a lot for a little girl. A year later, at age 13, Rachel gave her life to Jesus at a church youth camp. However, that experience didn't heal her heart. I loved Jesus. I was a Christian, but I was deeply in pain. I was deeply hurting. So when Rachel started high school, she began drinking and partying. Other people were doing it, and I wanted to fit in. You know, I wanted to be fun and cool and scary, so it was a life of the party. Being the life of the party included drugs. By her early 20s, Rachel was a cocaine addict, bouncing from relationship to relationship, some of them abusive. I was looking for somebody else to complete me, somebody else to make me feel worthy, somebody else to love me. I stuffed my trauma down. I tried to make it small. There was one bright spot. Rachel discovered a love and a talent for sportscasting and poured herself into pursuing it professionally after she graduated. Being a broadcaster was incredibly exciting and fun, and it scared me a lot. And so it kept me on my toes and it challenged me. Broadcasting for me was the connection. Getting to tell people stories. For the next nine years, Rachel gained respect and popularity as a sportscaster all while fighting a losing battle with her demons. So I still loved the Lord, but I knew I wasn't living for him. I mean, I was physically addicted, I was mentally addicted, I was all of those things. I just began to, this feeling in the pit of my stomach, I knew how bad off I was. I knew it. By 2009, she had dropped to a new low, selling drugs to support her addiction. She says it was then God spoke to her. He said, you are a runaway train going down the wrong way on the track. And you are going to kill yourself, kill somebody else, end up in jail, or all the above. And what I felt him saying was, I created you for more than this, my girl. I love you so much. Come home to me. A few days later, she came across a sermon on the radio. And I just began to weep. And I said, I'm, I'm tired. I don't want to run from God anymore. Still pulled by addiction, Rachel would use cocaine one last time. As soon as it hit my nose, I began to convulse and shake and weep. And I heard the Lord say to me, your body is not your own anymore. The next morning, I got cleaned up and I drove that car like Mario Andretti. You know, I could not get to church fast enough. I went and I felt, put my face down on that carpeted altar and I just wept and I wept and I wept. And I thank God for saving my life. I found in God at that time complete surrender. I cannot do this on my own. I need your help, Lord. The only way I can describe it is I was supernaturally delivered from a nine-year cocaine addiction. I never desired it again. After rededicating her life to Christ, Rachel says healing took time. God filled those holes with a beautiful message to say, you are enough in me. You don't need substances. You don't need things. You don't need the world. You don't need any of these things to be enough. I created you. I did not take the day off when you were made. It was a peace beyond understanding. And my middle name is Joy. God gave me my joy back. Over the next few years, Rachel reached new heights in her career until she retired in 2019. Now married, she runs a nonprofit organization, I'm Changing the Narrative, which promotes mental health and inspires others to build a positive legacy. Of all her accomplishments, Rachel believes she's doing her greatest work, sharing the truth that set her free. I've given my life to God, and He's given me something so beautiful in return. I'm living proof that there is life and love and peace and joy on the other side. There is fullness of life. Jesus came that you might have life.
and have it more abundantly. On the other side, there's life, there's peace, there's joy. And here's the wonderful thing. There's liberty, there's freedom. You don't have to be a slave of any compulsion. You can have the victory for, over it. You can have the victory through it. He will see you through to that victory. How do you get victory? It doesn't make any sense. It seems counterintuitive. You get the victory by surrendering. To say, God, I can't do this, but you can. And with you, I can do all things. Now, if you're like Rachel and you're trying to perform, you're trying to make it through uh, so that you can get the next hit, the next fix, the next whatever, and you're saying, I, I just, I, if, I, if I can only just control it and, and put it in designated time periods and do that, I can hide it, I can have it, I can do everything, I can make it all work. Well, just like Rachel, you're in a runaway train and you're heading the wrong way down the track and you know the end. You know the end will come. You'll know that you're just going to blow your life apart. But here's the wonderful news. If you just surrender, Jesus will take it. He will, he will give you a brand new mind, a brand new body chemistry. He will make all things new. He will make it so that you were never uh, under that compulsion at all. He can do that. He's that kind of God. He can remove the thoughts. He can remove the compulsion. He can do all of that. What he's waiting for is for you to surrender all, to say, this is not my body anymore. I don't have to be a slave to it. I can give it to him. Now, the Apostle Paul gives us some keys to this, and he talks about it in the book of Romans, where the things that I want to do, I'm unable to do, and the things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. And then he concludes, but I thank God for the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God for what he's given me, that he's enabled me to have the victory over the dominion of my own flesh. He is able to do that. Now, if you want this, it's that complete surrender where you say, Lord, I, I come to you. For some of you, that surrender may need a treatment plan. You may need to go into isolation, get away from any kind of substance that you're addicted to. But in that, you'll find victory at the other side. And here's the great news. You'll find peace, you'll find life, and you'll have it more abundantly. If you want this, bow your head with me. Let's pray a very simple prayer. Jesus will answer. He'll provide the way. He'll provide shelter for you. He'll provide advisors for you. He'll provide all of it if you just ask him. Let's pray. Jesus, say his name, say it out loud. Jesus, I surrender all. I come to you. Give me the peace. Give me the liberty. But most of all, give me you. Forgive me. I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed with me, give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from Colossians. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his love.